It happened over the weekend, sometime in late November 2022. So I was screening through Twitter and the one that got into my attention was tweeted by Sofian that Asia Group was allegedly hit by a ransomware group. 5 million unique passenger records as well as employee data were stolen and they were published online. That uh, is quite scary because there's a regional airline. I have flown AirAsia numerous times myself and would I expect that my data was exposed? I would think that's a good chance it was. The data theft incident in Malaysia is getting more serious. We are seeing the increase of such incidents both in private sector and government sectors. Basically, data theft is unauthorized access or unauthorized obtain of data. Criminals are harvesting data from various organizations, so it is a growing underground economy. Hackers are going after your data, and that's going to be the new economy for cybercrime. Casey, can you help me? Uh, just now the Kaushan detected a website attack on this server. Then can you help me have a look on this command line? From what I found, they are searching for the login patch. Earlier, there's one attempt attackers trying to upload a web shell scripts. Whenever this script is uploaded, to the web access servers, attackers were able to gain control on the systems and therefore they can extract out all the data available inside the websites. This is security operation centers. These people are security analysts. We are helping companies, organizations to monitor all their security threats in their environments. As attackers, their main objective is to extract out data. So they came in in various ways, such as send you malware disguised as a document, and this malware will extract out all the data. Malware is also known as malicious software. It is a software that is designed to give unauthorized access for the hackers to the end consumer's computers. Basically, data theft is unauthorized access or unauthorized obtain of data. Data such as personal data, your IC number, your home address, um, your birth date, if they are dispersed, they wouldn't have much value. But if you put them together, it forms a useful information to tell people basically your age, your economy status based on the areas that you're living. The information to certain organizations or to certain people, they're always worth money. Criminals are harvesting data from various organizations, so it is a growing underground economy. This is a live server attacks activities ongoing throughout the whole world. As you can see in the map, there are lines coming from one country shooting across to another country. Basically, they represent the origin of the attacks and the country that is being attacked. We also see the lines have different colors. It represents the severities of the attack. Green means the severity the attack is low. Blue means medium. Orange refers to high and red is critical. In Malaysia, what we saw at Fortinet was on an average 84 million attacks daily detected and defended by Fortinet in 2023. That's 1% of global attacks what we see. And when you really look at Malaysian context, 25% of Malaysian GDP is going to get digitized by 2025. As you bring in more digitization, 
your data which is getting stored gets more valuable. When we look at the magnitude of cybercrime in Malaysian market, it's pretty high. Where we see close to about 45% of people who reported breaches have reported saying the cost of the breach is more than a million dollars lost to them in Malaysia. Hackers are going after your data. And that's going to be the new economy for cybercrime. Data theft is a global phenomenon. If you look at ASEAN as an example, I'm afraid to say at the top, Malaysia ranks number one in terms of data compromise. Our first reason is, of course, our Data Protection Act. The Act itself, I would say, is immature. In this country, we do not have a law that specifically spell out mandatory requirements for disclosure. Sometimes organisations who got hacked, they just keep it under the carpet. And also because there's no mandating law, the organisations themselves are not accountable for compensation for any kind of damage control. If the law mandates accountability, meaning that if there's an organisation that are responsible for data leak, right, and then they will be penalised because of the consequences, I think this one will change the mentality of many organisations to be more proactive in terms of protection. Because right now the situation is, cybersecurity has only come in as an afterthought. Asia has acknowledged the cyber attack, but there's no mention on what happens to the person data, or what's the repercussions. Did they inform the affected passengers? There's no details on that. About the Air Asia breach, I actually find it out from um, this site called Data Breaches, capital D and capital B, a site that tech journalists finds very reliable when it comes to data breach. Data breaches actually unveiled and reported that the hackers has actually approached them and told them that we have data from AirAsia. There are two CSV files. Data breaches actually posted the screenshots that Dyxin team, the hackers, have given them themselves. The first file contained information on employee data with numerous fields such as personal information. So they have date of birth, date of joining the company, seniority, secret questions for each employees, secret answer, crew, portal, numbers, birth city, birth state. And next CSB file, we can see the passenger ID, name, and also the booking number, as well as the total cost. So, yeah, it looks pretty legit. If these personal details of passengers fall into the wrong hands, it can be misused for social engineering attacks by hackers and scammers. So, for example, based on the transaction amount, they could probably make assumption that an uh, individual that makes a higher transaction amount is more affluent. And perhaps, based on that information, they can actually narrow down uh, who they want to target for scam attempts. I would say both leaks are severe enough. Asia is huge in Malaysia and around the region because of their low fares. There's also Asia in Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand. Asia is a very data-rich company. Any company with that much of data in hand would be a target of hacker. The Asia data breach was quite surprising because I will see the Asia as a digital first company who will probably do these kind of things more securely. They are pretty tech savvy in a sense that uh, way before any companies were working on their digital advancement, Asia was already on it. Asia is full of data because of all their flying passengers. So with the data in hand, they started expanding their super app very gradually. Starting with book your flight, book accommodation and plan your trips abroad. Within the super app, there is also AirAsia Ride Services, which is typically like the Grab services, whereby users can book rides to any destination that is available, including airports. So in that sense, when you don't have to leave the app, to use any other services, that's when an app is a super app. But that also gives a very um, 
a very fragile point. I know they've got a huge number of users on app. The in-between of, of, of their super app growing was when the data breach happened. We had no idea where the data breach happened exactly. Was it their backend? Was it their website or their app? Asia Group was allegedly hit by Tai Singh's ransomware group. If you don't pay the ransoms, they will destroy the files. Your files won't be able to recover. I have flown AirAsia numerous times myself. Maybe my data was exposed. I would think there's a good chance it was. So, let's say there's been a data breach. How do you know what kind of data uh, you have exposed? So generally, they'll come down to understanding the data that's is collected about you. Um, we actually have an example here of the AirAsia app page on the Google Play Store as of 26 December 2023. So if you take a look at the type of data collected by the app, it says here collects your personal info, such as your name, email address, user ID, address, and phone number. Next, the AirAsia app also collects app interactions. This generally refers to the behavior of a consumer within the app itself. And behavior can be things like what screens you look at in a sequence, what kind of items attract your interest or that you spend more time on. That really covers anything and everything in between what you touch and what you see. The next type of data that's collected in the AirAsia app uh, is location information. You can see that it collects both the approximate location and the precise location. Uh, approximate location uh, generally, on both uh, Android and iOS platforms, we'll refer to um, location data that's quite coarse, somewhere between 1 to 10 kilometers in terms of granularity. So this location information, that means it's where the user is uh, while they're using the application. Precise location will generally be pretty accurate GPS information up to 10 meters. This data is pretty valuable for third-party purposes. There's a whole supply chain, and what can happen to that user data is it gets sent to data brokers and sell it to other companies. Data brokers are companies which collect information about the user, including things like user data, location, what devices they're using. Um, the data brokers aggregate this information, process it at a large scale bundle them up and then they sell them to other companies or put them on the marketplace. There's sort of an intermediary between some end user of the user data, which tends to be large businesses, and the actual developers or publishers of uh, apps or websites. So if you know a user's location history, profile information, including addresses, demographic information like uh, their income level, their age group. This kind of information does allow very targeted marketing and advertising to be performed. Everything in the supply chain thus far in this example is really completely le legitimate. The user has probably opted in on the app to agree to provide their information. But if anywhere in the supply chain, if there is a data breach, this is the kind of information that could be exposed about a particular individual. Good morning, team. Thank you for being in the call today. For your information, our analyst has found an attack ongoing in one of our clients' environment. We are required to respond to this incident this is considered code red. We'll be having this war room activated 24 by 7 until the incident is resolved. 
This is security operation center to where all the actions take place in the cyber threat landscape that we are monitoring. An incident has been detected in one of our clients' organization. It's a ransomware incident. So when this type of incident happen, we are going into a firefighting mode. Incident responder team, please help to start quarantine and isolate the machine affected. Security analyst, I would like you to pull out 30 days of logs, see what was detected prior to this attack. Okay, threat intelligence team, I need you to find out who this threat actor is, what are their tactics, techniques and procedures that they are using. Marcus is actually doing the investigation on finding out how the attack happened when the attack is being established and why the attack is happening. What we have detected so far is actually we found out that the attacker actually uh, they utilize uh, zero-day vulnerabilities on our client servers to get into our client environments. Every software, there could be bugs within their codes that will actually give rise to vulnerabilities. We coined a term in our industry called Zero Day. It's a vulnerability that hasn't been disclosed or discovered by any other cybersecurity practitioners or defenders. When it has been discovered by the threat actors, they use this Zero Day vulnerability to exploit and launch the attack because it's new. So that is where the security applications fail to pick up the attack. Threat actor started attack using a mentality that try to avoid being detected. And then when they move to their attack point, they actually blow off their attack. So that is where actually they are open to being seen already. Because when they have already started to deploy their ransomware, they are telling you we are already here in the system, exploited the system. And then we try to fire fight from there. We look into who is actually attacking, what are their motivations, what do they really want, do they really actually have the data because some attackers, they say they do have data but it turns out it's not sensitive information, it's public general information. If there's more software being developed, there will be more zero days. If a big software company finds a zero day before it is, they patch it, fine. But when it comes to when they don't know about it, while you can put your robust security system in place, the threat actors always try to be one step ahead. We just got a new project. We have to target one Malaysian entity for the client, gaining access into their systems, dump and extract any kind of user data from their environment. We are engaged to go on offense, attack the corporation or the organization or company that engaged us. We'll do whatever it takes. Any kind of techniques, any kind of tactics, usually it's no host bar, where we hack and hack and hack and hack to get to the objective. The objective could be to find flaws in not just the servers and the applications, but the organization as a whole. Cybersecurity, in essence, is not just the servers or the network or your applications. In an organization, there is people, there's policies, there's processes. Cybersecurity is a whole thing. So it's our job to find these loopholes. It's either we find it first or the bad actors find it first and use it to their own advantage. So that's why it's always a cat and mouse game between us and the black hats. So what you see here on the left side is the attacker machine, which is what I'm controlling. And on the right side, you see, we call it victim machine. So from here, I'll try to communicate with the victim server so I know that this server in scope has this IP, which is 192.168.217.155, and I am able to ping or communicate with it. After making sure that I can communicate with the victim server, what I'll do is I'll start to do a port scan, just to find 
what are the services or applications that may be running on the server itself. So the port scanning is done. I can see here that it's actually running a very old and vulnerable version of Windows Server 2008. Now it's already 2024. So we still find a lot of organizations, big corporations, even small, uh, medium enterprises, they still use end-of-life OSs like this. And from here, I know to use this particular exploit. I will need to set up some configurations in order for my machine to send the exploit over to the server. So I'm setting the target which is the victim server and what's then done, I would do an exploit. So now you can see that the exploit is running and it's actually in progress of sending it over to the server. And now you see this win here, and we actually have access into the server. As you can see here, I'm running commands on my machine. I'm actually in the server and I'm able to run commands on my own wheel. So I just type the command just to see where am I now in the server and I know that I'm in the System32 folder. But what if I like to move around and try to scout the server and see if I can find anything interesting? So I can see here there's a user folder named Cathy. Thinking from a hacker perspective, I would usually target the users first. The users or human in general is the weakest link in cybersecurity. So there could be potentially something hidden in the user's directory. Now I can see there are quite a number of directories that I can go to. I will always try to go towards the desktop first because I believe everyone keeps certain files on the desktop. And I'm currently listing out what are the files available on the desktop. You can see there are some interesting items on my own machine, attacker machine, we can see admin credentials.txt, my wallpaper.bmp, user database.csv, which is very interesting. Let's go over to the victim server and see whether this matches up. There you can see on the victim server, right, there is the admin credentials.txt, my wallpaper, and the user database.csv. So it matches hand in hand. So what I'm gonna do now. I would download the documents. So we open up the user database that we have downloaded earlier and this is even more interesting. It seems like it's a treasure trove of user data. It could be the employee's data, for example. It could be customer data because it seems like there is a first name, last name, company name, address, city, country, state, zip, phone numbers, email, and website. And these are all personal data. Technically, we have stolen data of the victim. By showing this, it shows how data theft could actually happen. As you can see, uh, when I download the file, there are no difference in the victim machine or the server. There are no pop-ups. There's nothing to show to the victim like there's something going on here. Most sophisticated hackers, they will infiltrate in the organization, conceal their tracks, open up the back doors so they can constantly visit and stay resident within an organization. There are certain categories of hackers who are more patient, who are aimed for long-term benefits, uh, for 
several purposes, maybe for financial gain or maybe for political purposes. Now, these group of hackers are the scarier ones. We do not know what are the information they are stealing from organizations, and we have no idea are they going to impersonate any of our you know, organization's employee to carry out activities on behalf of the organizations. So there's a lot of unknown of what these categories of hackers can possibly do. We do not know when are they going to strike. Most of the time when we heard about cyber attacks, right, a lot of the cyber attacks are related to ransomware. group was allergy hit by Tai Sing ransomware group. It was a ransomware attack. Now the Tai Sing team is known for their attacks towards healthcare organizations. They have a track record of doing such cyber security incidents. They encrypt the files in the whole ransom. So if you want your data back, you need to pay the ransom money, then they'll decrypt it. Ransomware can come in many forms. I will show you how a ransomware attacks are coming from the emails. Nowadays, we see a lot of cases where people use companies' computers or laptops for personal use, which lead to the system being hacked, especially downloading files from an email. You can see here, I received emails, Mobile Legends Diamond Generator has released a new version. Download the latest versions to get a free diamonds. I'm the Mobile Legends user, so I feel that this is free diamonds to upgrade my levels. I click Downloads. As you can see, there's a new file being created over here, which is Mobile Legends Diamonds Generator.exe. So we will run these files. As you can see, multiple files have been created in the download folders and as well on the desktops. And all of our files have been encrypted. That's where they will change to another file extension names. They will start to pop up today that all your files have been encrypted. Previously, I can open my files by building invoice files. So right now, let me open my files. You can see here, all my files in unknown characters. You won't be able to uh, open your original files. They create a fear in the users. There's a ransomware note has been appeared on my PC. It says that all your important files are encrypted, such as your documents, your Excels, your PDF, your bills, your taxations. And they will give you a message. You can recover your files safely, but there's a time limit. You need to act fast. Please pay us the payments. You only have two more days and 23 hours left. They will give you an instruction on how to pay. You need to pay 300 worth of Bitcoin to the Bitcoin wallet address. So that's where you need to pay to the ransom. So if you don't pay the ransoms, they will destroy the decryptor key and your files won't be able to recover. This is a WannaCry ransomware, which is famous on May 2017. This ransomware is just only pure to encrypt your data. Right now, the ransomware are getting more and more sophisticated. Basically, this is a ransomware group's blog. This blog is hosted on the dark web, whereby if you try to access this particular URL in your normal browser, you would not be able to access it. This is where they post a list of their victims. Ransomware doesn't just encrypt the victim's data, they also steal the victim's data. They do double extortion, like we would say, whereby the victim loses access to their files and they also have the risk of having their sensitive data exposed or published to the internet. They basically just publish some of the screenshots to show the sample data that they have stolen from the victims. These are sensitive documents uh, containing their financials, official letters, bank statements, even passports. 
these are legitimate data. A company won't disclose this data publicly. So when this data is published by the ransomware website, it shows that they have gained access to the company's data. So this list of victims, some of them have a timer. So basically this is a remaining time for them to pay the ransom. And some of them has published, which means that their data has been published because they have not paid the ransom. This is not the only ransomware block available on the dark web. There are probably more than hundreds of ransomware groups, but this is just one of the more prominent ransomware groups. This is where the victims or even other hackers, they get to see a list of all their successful victims. They know how established this ransomware is. For the ransomware group, in terms of actually hacking the victims, this doesn't have to be done by them. You can consider them as software developers. So the software that they develop are ransomwares. Basically, this ransomware group provides ransomware as a service. So they are selling or renting these softwares to hackers who have gained access to a victim or a company. When they run or execute this ransomware, that's where the developers of this ransomware get paid. Hackers who want to work with them, uh, they are working as an affiliate with uh, this ransomware group. So these ransomware groups also tell them what are the rules, how does this ransomware work, and what is the cost when you're working as an affiliate. Ransomware is a very lucrative business. Asia Group was allegedly hit by Tai Sing ransomware group. If Asia failed to negotiate, hackers could resort to sending the database to third parties. Ransomware can be a huge disruptor for airlines because it can disrupt critical systems, it can delay flights, and it has happened to several airlines before and worldwide. I believe SpiceJet in India was hit by ransomware. It affected their flights, which can cause huge losses for airlines. The Dyson Group tried to claim that they are ethical, so they said they avoid going for the critical systems that can affect safety and human lives. Asia acknowledged that they were hit by ransomware attack and they claim that it's only affecting their redundant systems and it does not affect their critical systems. And they assured that they've taken all immediate measures to resolve the issue and prevent future incidents from happening again. And they also stress again that there's no operational or financial impact to the company at the time. And as we can see, uh, there's no reported flight delays or disruptions for that period. DataBusiness.net, who got in touch with Tai Group, reported that Asia actually responded to Tai Sing and they asked how Tai Sing will delete the data if they made the payment. After that, there was no response from Asia. Asia apparently did not even try to negotiate the amount. So Asia did not budge and did not agree to pay. Ransomware is very predominant today and it's very widely because it's rewarding. I hold ransom on your data. If you pay me, I release your data. If not, I sell your data on the dark web. Obviously, as cybersecurity practitioners, we would say it's a no-no to pay because what happens when you do, uh, it tends to actually create a profile for yourself that you are a good paymaster, so you will attract more attention, really. uh, but it depends, right? The more critical one is ransomware, is locking you from performing your operations. You hear of shipping companies around the world which was crippled for 10 days and that's a lot of money. In terms of a hospital operations, if you are shut down from operating your ICU and everything, there are certain life-threatening circumstances which may make the decision-making a little bit different. So I basically just pay the ransom to get back to business immediately. So quietly, I don't lose my reputation. I think it goes down to the fact that different track actors have different uh, mindsets and you know, uh, 
modus operandi. Even if I get paid, I could choose to sell your data on the dark web. So here I have some sample data. This data that are leaked includes a victim's name, phone number, email address, and date of birth. So how scammers would use this data is first, they already have a way to contact you, either through phone number or email address. So when they start a conversation with you, if they know your data and they can tell it to you, it will make it more convincing to the victims to say that, oh, this person may be valid uh, authority or legitimate professional who um, has my data and who has uh, something to discuss or talk with me. That's when uh, they try to gain your trust and start their scam and try to get you to pay them some money. Data on the dark web, I would say it's quite similar to data leaked or published on the internet. It's not easy to remove all traces. So on the dark web, it's even harder because you can't trace the owners of the websites that are hosted on the dark web. So I would say it's very difficult to be able to remove all traces of a specific data on the dark web. We are actually monitor organizations whether their data has been posted up for sales into the dark web. This is where we monitor for all the dark web activities we are filtering just to see what's the activity happening in Malaysia. On the month of November 2023, there's more than 20 successful attacks to the Malaysia. 20 successful data leakage that is related to the data theft has been posted into the dark web. We are in an uphill battles with the hackers. Hackers are using automated solutions to automate their attacks. They work 24 by 7, 365 days a year. So when you have an automated solutions and these solutions are constantly improving themselves to find loopholes within the organizations, it is a pace that we human is hard to catch up. There's a lot of leaked username and passwords out there in the dark web. Criminal groups are also buying these data from the dark web. These are useful for attackers, for hackers, because they can use this to do a more effective password cracking to gain access into an organization. In cybersecurity, most of the time we refer to password cracking as a brute force attack, meaning that the attackers will be using a very primitive way by guessing different combinations of password and username. The moment they manage to guess the correct username and password, that's how they gain access into an organization. Even though the brute force attack itself is very primitive, but yet it is very effective. What I will demonstrate is how an attacker will use the leaked username and password to perform this brute forcing attack. So these are the examples of leaked usernames, and these are the examples of the leaked passwords. If it's not a leaked username and password list, then the success rate of it will be very low. But since it's a leaked username and password, then the success rate will increase by a lot. Usually, if an organization has been hacked, right, it could be either customer data or employee data that has been hacked, or even both. The organization will have informed their employees about it but sometimes if they didn't do that and employees didn't change their password by performing this brute forcing, right, I can easily guess the correct username and password log in then hack into their account. Now I have retrieved the user credentials right here. So I will attempt to log in to their account. We have successfully entered the user account. I previously have prepared a malicious script and now I will be pasting it into here. 
I put in my malicious script in there and I update my script into the victim server. If the user triggered what I put in my malicious script, I will have a backdoor access to their server. This hack is called remote code execution. So for instance, I will trigger in order to gain access to their server. As you can see, I've successfully entered to their server. I can get all the information I want from here. If it's a bank, you just get the bank details of the users, also username, password, the address, their credit card information, and also maybe the transaction, what they have purchased. If it's an airline, you'll be able to get their account information and their flight details, where they are going to, when will they be departing, when will they be coming back from their holiday, their trip. Leak details like this, they could be used for social engineering attacks against a victim. Um, in one scenario, a hacker might pretend to be an authorized representative of the company. You know, they contact the user since they have some information that no one else should have about the user. The user may be lulled into thinking they really are a representative of the company. They might be able to perform an unauthorized transaction for the user or they may be able to obtain more data about the user that they can use in a future attack. We also have seen uh, organized crime group has been investing a lot into their research and they are also buying and selling trade secrets, zero-day vulnerabilities in the dark web and to give themselves an upper hand to attack others. And on top of that, we also seen countries playing a part to sponsor some of the hacking groups to make the hacking group look for the purpose of the country. The key point is, the landscape is wider today. It's not just your computer, it's not just your server. It's your mobile phone, your laptop. These are all open for breaches. In Malaysia, especially in the past few years, we've seen a lot of data breaches involving not just the private sector, but also on government platforms as well. In 2022, one of the biggest data breaches was personal data that allegedly came from the National Registration Department as well as the Election Commission. The National Registration Department is quite huge, involved like 22 million records. Like for example, the name, IC number, gender, race, address, religion, and also the photos as well that's on the IC. The next one is the Election Commission data breach involving databases of 800,000 voter personal information. You can see here there are lots of photos of Malaysians taking a selfie while holding an IC. The IC photo as well as the selfie as part of the online registration process to register as a voter. This is scary because you can use this to open accounts at various platforms including e-wallets and various services. Data custodians hold a very important responsibility and accountability. But unfortunately in Malaysia, we have a few insufficient factors. The law, the legal framework itself do not govern the government. So meaning that if any government employees deliberately or accidentally cause the data leak, no one will be accountable for. And that's one of the reasons why I think we will expect to constantly see government employees at the agency level still continue to have negligence in terms of data protection. We usually the private sector move much faster when it comes to protection. The government as a whole is actually coming up with uh, proposing a cybersecurity bill, which is in its draft stage at the moment, and probably hopefully by the next parliament setting they will actually uh, present it to parliament. They are slowly moving towards having more guidelines so that companies are able to better tread in this new digital realm. And that will, over time, help the cyber hygiene of the country. In cybersecurity, nothing is 100% secure. There's no foolproof method to prevent all of this. It's always a cat and mouse game. The antivirus providers, endpoint protection providers can only do so much to catch up with the hackers. So the most important thing is always at the user side. We need to be aware of what we are interacting with, what we download, what we run. That is the most important thing.